message, and especially on this occasion. My, my wife and I have been here for six months. We arrived in Greensburg on September 26th at 11.27 p.m. <laughs> and we made up our minds when we decided to come here and accept the privilege, and it is indeed a privilege to be the pastor of First Baptist Church, that we were going to become a part of the community. And it's a lot easier to become a part of a community when the community accepts you. And we want you to know that we have felt very accepted over the past six months. And we are truly praying for our brothers and sisters at the Christian Church so that they can find a pastor so that I won't be the new guy anymore. <laughs> It's Good Friday, and just, just a little bit of history about this day is, we know, you might know that this day wasn't always called Good Friday. It used to be called Black Friday. And the reason that it was called Black Friday is you, when you look at what took place, Jesus suffered, he hung on the cross, he died. They looked at that situation, they said, you know, that's not good, it's, it's, it's bad, he suffered. So they called it Black Friday. But we have to look at the big picture. We have to look at Jesus being the Lamb of God, Jesus being that spotless Lamb that was sacrificed so that all of creation could be redeemed and so that humanity could have an opportunity for salvation, and that's good. And so somebody got the right idea, and they said, you know, let's not call it Black Friday anymore. Let's call it Good Friday. Because a good thing came out of what happened on this day, 2000, over 2,000 years ago. And so there's a lesson to be learned in that. And that lesson is that good things can come from suffering. Now, if we are going to call ourselves Christians, if we're going to say that we follow a risen Christ, then we must believe that because Suffering took place on Good Friday, but a good thing and salvation came out of Good Friday. So good things can come from suffering. Right. So a greater lesson to learn from that is that good things can come out of our suffering. Yeah. Now, in saying that, and I said this at Bible study on Wednesday, I'm not saying go home and pray, Lord, please send me suffering. <laughs> Just keep living life. It's guaranteed at one point or another. And it's okay when those times come to pray, Lord, let me out of this suffering. But it's also important to realize that from that suffering, good things can come. So that's our brief lesson on Good Friday. There's a word from the Lord today. Are we ready for a word from the Lord? Yes. What is going to come to us this morning, this evening? You can tell that preachers are used to talking. <laughs> it's going to come to us from the Gospel according to John, the 18th chapter, the 28th through the 38th verse. Now at this point, Jesus has instituted the Lord's Supper. He's gone to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's been arrested. He's been taken to the priest. And the priests are now bringing him before Pilate. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. I'd ask that all who could would please stand in reverence to God's word. Once again, John 18, 28 through 38. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the Praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him and said, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him, judge him according to your laws. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. That's the way of saying that Jesus might be fulfilled what he said when he spoke of how he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, 
Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now, my kingdom is not of here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly, I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who hears the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said that, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault with him at all. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. You may be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Good Friday. Because we know even with your birth, at any time you could have said that you weren't going to do it, but you chose to hang on that old rugged cross so that we might have an opportunity for salvation, so that creation might be redeemed. And we know that even with this Good Friday, the story doesn't end here because we know on Sunday morning they found an empty tomb, and we thank you, God, for that empty tomb. Heavenly Father, allow this message to go forth in the way that you would have it to go. Open hearts, open minds, that it might be received, and use me as your vessel to deliver it in the way that you would have it to be received. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to take as a title for this text, The Truth Is. And the question that is asked in this text is, what is truth? I would ask, what is truth? And that is a question that has gone throughout time and memorial, people asking, what is truth? And so as we examine this text today, we are going to answer that question, and what is truth? So we're looking at this text, and... Jesus now is before Pilate. Pilate is, if you hadn't realized, Pilate's sort of an important dude here. He's the, uh, pro he's the prefect, is the title, prefect of Judea. That means that he's the guy in charge. He controls the lives of the Jews. If he decides that Jesus is guilty, then Jesus is guilty. If he decides that Jesus is innocent, then Jesus is innocent. But the thing is, Pilate really didn't want to be bothered. He tells them, he says, you know what, go take this man and judge him according to your laws. Well, the priests say, well, you know, we can't do that because we don't have the ability to execute anyone. So they're telling Pilate, this Jesus guy, this guy that we're bringing to you, he is so dangerous. He is so much of a problem that he needs to be executed. Now they say we don't have the power to execute anyone, but what you, what you find interesting is as we read the Gospels, we find that that is not totally true. After all, when Jesus was walking and they found the woman in adultery, the only thing that stopped that crowd from stoning that woman to death was that Jesus held out a stone and said, you who is without sin cast the first stone. And so they dropped their stones and they left from the oldest to the youngest, the person with the most sin to the person with the least. When Jesus was preaching in his hometown, some people got so enraged that they tried to throw him off a cliff. And after he had gone back to heaven, Stephen became the first Christian martyr when they stoned him to death for proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it's obvious that the Jewish people could put someone to death, and it didn't cause much of a problem. So why are the priests, why are they saying right now that, Pilate, you need to do this? Well, why did they arrest him at night? They could have arrested him during the day. They saw him in the temple. He preached in the temple. Well, they also saw what took place when he entered Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday. They saw the people crying, Hosanna, Lord in the highest. Glory be to the king. They saw how popular he was. They saw, if we arrest him during the day, if we put him to death, that might cause a problem. And we also have to remember, this is Passover, so Jerusalem is bursting with people. That might have caused 
a riot. And Pilate was not big on riots. He would have put it down quickly and swiftly, and that would have caused a lot of death and bloodshed. So the priests say, well, you know, let's just make the Romans the bad guys here. Let's not put Jesus to death ourselves. Let's have the Romans do it. And so Pilate is now standing before Jesus, and they're having a conversation. He asks Jesus, are you a king? And after some back and forth, Jesus finally does say, yes, I am the king. My kingdom's not of this world. I have come to bear witness to truth. And everyone who recognizes truth can hear my voice. And to that, Pilate asks the question, what is truth? But he doesn't wait for the answer. He turns around and he simply leaves. Now let's face it. If you and I are honest, the fact is that every human being at some point in their lives asks that question, what is truth? In order to get a good answer, though, we have to first ask ourselves, what type of truth are we asking for? Are we asking for God's truth, or are we asking for man's truth? Because there is a difference. Amen. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way which seems right to humanity, but the end of that way is death. So we have to decide, what type of truth are we looking for? When we look at humanity, there, there are people who can say that there is no such thing at all as absolute truth. Now, if there is no absolute truth, that means that life also has no meaning. And I don't know about you, but if a person can think that, and there are people who, think, who do think that, that's scary. Life has no meaning, there is no absolute truth, but when I look at Pilate, I think Pilate might have fallen into this category. Because when I look at Pilate, the fact is that for Pilate, truth was whatever Pilate said. And Pilate was standing one day in his palace, and he looked down and he said, you know, the Jews need, they haven't been good Jews. They need to be taught a lesson. And he sent the Roman army in to teach them a lesson. It was true. They were not good people at that time simply because Pilate said it. Pilate says Jesus is guilty, he's guilty. He says he's innocent, he's innocent. Whatever Pilate said, that was truth. So truth could change at the whim of Pilate. Only one other person could have even greater authority, and that was Caesar. If Caesar sent down a decree and said, this is what is true, then that is what was true. So, so there are these people that will say there is no absolute truth. There is no true meaning to life. There is a way which seems right to men. For some people, truth is personal. So whatever your personal truth is, whatever you develop within yourself, that is what is true. Now, that might not make sense to anybody else. It might not jive with what other people think, but that's okay because it's your personal truth. But the problem with that, let's look at the consequences. If, if I can say whatever I want to be true is true, then if my neighbor has something that I want and he's not using it and I take it, that's okay. My personal truth says that it's okay because they weren't using it. So I can take it. My personal truth might say that the strong survive and the weak die. So if I decide that I want my neighbor's possessions and I want all of them and I decide that I'm going to do away with my neighbor, that is okay. Survival of the fittest, that is my personal truth. And there are still people today that believe that. Survival of the fittest. It's dangerous. In the 1930s, the Germans had a personal truth that said that they were the ones who would go forth and they would build the master race. And that personal truth allowed for them to exterminate anyone who did not fit the picture of the master race. That personal truth allowed for forced abortions, euthanasia. That personal truth allowed for human experimentation, but it was all okay because that is my truth and you cannot say that it is incorrect. There are some people that say that truth is all about perception. My perception is true, so what I believe to be true is true. Now, here's the danger with that. I'm pretty sure that every one of you has known somebody in your life that has been, let's just say, less than honest. Now, let's just call it what it is. They were a liar. And they would tell a lie. 
I, I, I actually have a person in my mind right now, I won't mention any names, but they will tell a lie for so long that it, eventually they believe that lie to be true because they've told it for so long. Now, based on this thought about truth, the minute that they perceive that lie to be true, it becomes true. There was a man who um, got convicted. He stole hundreds of thousands of dollars from his company. When his family asked him, well, you know, if you had a chance to go back and do anything different, what would you do? He said, I'd make sure I didn't get caught. <laughs> well, as is the case in prison, he, gets, he goes to prison and he continuously tells everybody, you know, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. I, I just didn't do it. They got the wrong guy. He says this month after month, year after year, and it gets to a point where he tells this lie so much that he actually starts to believe it. Now, based on personal truth, the minute that he starts to believe that lie is true, we've got to let it go because it's the truth. But there's a way that seems right to man. There are some people that would say that truth is based on circumstances, so your circumstances dictate what your truth is. My circumstances are different from your circumstances, so my truth is different from your truth. I think that's what, when we look at our text, I think that that's what was going on with the priest. The priest looked at the circumstances and they said, you know, this Jesus is a dangerous man. The circumstances dictated that he was dangerous. So they said, you know, we've got to get rid of him. I mean, this uneducated, so-called rabbi, he's causing problems. The, the relationship with the Romans is already stressed, so we need to get rid of this wannabe prophet from this backwater city called Nazareth in an unknown province called Galilee. We have to get rid of him. Circumstances dictated it because circumstances dictated those circumstances make what they say true. I can think of a lot of politicians who might believe that the exact same way circumstances state that is true. Now, there are people who believe all of these kinds of truths, but the most interesting group are the people that believe all of these truths. See, there's a group of people that say that there are multiple truths. All truth is valid. These people would say to me, they'd say, yes, Jesus is a way to God. Key word, way, a way. Not what Jesus said, I am the way. Jesus is a way to God. But Islam has a valid way to God. Buddhism has a valid way to God. All religions have a valid way to God. All truth is truth. That's an interesting way of thinking. All truth is truth. There would even be some that would go so far as to say you don't have to find a way to God. If you look at the tree, you see the spirit of God. If you look at the grass, you see the spirit of God. If you look at a flower, you see the spirit of God. If you look at your dog at home, you see the spirit of God. My problem with that is when I read the creation story, it says that God spoke and he created the sun and the moon and the skies. He created the sea, he created the land and all the animals that walk on land. But it says he created them with the word. Never once does it say anything about his spirit until he creates Adam, in which it says he breathed his spirit into Adam. When I sit on the porch and I look at a sunset, it is beautiful. And I do not see the spirit of God. What I see is God's hand. I see his creation. I see his work, but I don't see him. But some people would say, no, all of it is the same. All of it is valid. And, and based on that, God can be whoever you want God to be. The problem with that is, if that's the case, God ceases to be the creator and he becomes the created. Whatever we have in our mind. But when we look at this, when we see all of these views of truth, you can see how it's hard to answer that question for some people. What is truth? So, what's the answer? What, what is truth? Well, we first we have to admit that either there is one absolute truth, or there is no truth. 
And the truth is that the truth is the Word. The truth is Jesus. Our text today comes out of the book of John. In the beginning of the book of John, John starts out and he just lets us know. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. In the beginning, he made all things, and without him, nothing was made. He was the light, and that light shined into darkness, and darkness could not overcome it. But it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God. He, he was with God. So who's he? Well, he is the word. So that's saying in the beginning, Jesus was, was with God. In the beginning, Jesus was God. It's telling us right there that that is what truth is. Truth is Jesus. Truth is the word. Amen. The truth is that at the fall of humanity, humanity needed a way for salvation. And God made a promise that he would Give us that way towards salvation. But then what happened was he looked out through the lens of history and he could not discover a person that could save all of humanity. He, didn't, he couldn't find a person that could redeem creation. He looked and he saw Noah and he said, no, nope, Noah's not going to work. He looked and he saw Samuel and he saw Samson and he saw Gideon and he said, yeah, wise men, but that, that, they're not going to work. Then he saw David. He said, a man after my own heart. This mighty king of Israel. But he realized that David wasn't going to work. The reason none of those people work is because in order for creation to be redeemed, in order for all of mankind to have an opportunity of salvation, it had to be a spotless, unblemished lamb that was sacrificed. The truth is that that spotless and that unblemished lamb came to us in the form of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. That is the truth. When Jesus was with us on earth, he, and his time drew near to a close, he realized that his time was short. And so he had his last meal with his disciples. He went out to the garden and he was arrested. The priests took him, and then they sat, sat him before Pilate. <clears throat> Pilate looked at him, and he asked that very famous question, what is truth? But unfortunately for Pilate, he didn't wait for the answer. But the incredible thing is, if he had waited for the answer, he might have at that point realized that truth was what was standing in front of him. But he didn't. Truth was with the priests, but they didn't realize that it was there. Pilate goes and he offers truth to the crowd. He says, you can have Jesus or you can have Barabbas. And instead of truth, they ask for Barabbas. That's the truth. And it happens today. The truth can be standing in front of people when people become blinded. They come to the point where they cannot see it because they are seeing all of these other things that the world says is truth. But there is a way that seems right to humanity, but the end for that way is death. So, Pilate says, you can have who you want. You can have the truth. You can have Jesus, or you can have this thief Barabbas, and they ask for the thief. And so Jesus is taken to the cross. He is placed on the cross. He is crucified. At some point, the text tells us that Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the reason that that happens, because at that moment, Jesus took on himself all the sins of the world, sins past, present, and future. And God cannot look on sin. So at that moment, God turned his back on his son. And for the first time in his life, Jesus could not feel the presence of God. And he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then the text tells us that as it was coming to an end, that it, Jesus, it says in John, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and, he filled it, and they filled it with a sponge and put it on hyssop 
and put it up to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. What is truth? People ask, what is truth? Well, this is truth. The truth is that all of creation needed to be redeemed. The truth is that humanity needed a path to salvation, and God made that promise. The truth is that Jesus was the fulfillment of that promise. What is truth? The truth is that today, Good Friday, is the day that we recognize that truth hung on an old rugged cross. What is truth? Truth, the truth is that because Jesus hung on that cross, the work of redemption, the work of Christ being redeeming the world, the work of salvation is finished. There is nothing that we can do to add to it. There is nothing that we can do to make it better. All that we can do is accept the gift that Jesus has given to us. That is truth. The truth is, that on the day when they took Jesus down off that cross, Pilate and the priests and all of the people in Jerusalem thought that the story was over. They said that truth is dead. Sort of like people today who will say God is dead. But we know that that is not the truth because the truth is that a few days later, some women were going to a tomb. They were talking to each other. They said, how are we going to roll this stone away? But when they got to the tomb, the stone was rolled away. They went inside the tomb. The tomb was empty. They came outside. An angel was waiting and said, why do you look for the living amongst the dead? He is risen just as he said. The truth is that the tomb is empty. Uh, that is the truth. The truth is that at any time in his time on this earth, Jesus could have easily said, you know what, Franklin Ruff is not worth it. He could have said, those people in Greensburg in the 21st century, they aren't worth it. He could have said, humanity is not worth it. He did not have to die. So why? Why did he do it? Why did he do it? Well, the truth is that he did it because you're worth it. Amen. He did it because he loves me. He did it because he loves you. He did it because he loves us. He did it because he did think that we were worth him hanging and suffering on that cross. And that there are times in many of our lives when we look and we say, I'm not worth the sacrifice that Jesus made for me. That is not the truth. That is a lie. You are worth it. You are worth it. Because Jesus said that you're worth it. That is the truth. Many of us have had times, all of us have had times in our lives when we search for the truth. And there may have been times when God sent it to us. A loved one, someone we didn't even know, a stranger who brings the truth to us and for whatever reason we don't know it. Maybe, just maybe, someone right now sitting in the sanctuary is searching for the truth. Where well, I'm here to tell you that the truth is in Jesus Christ. Open your heart, open your mind, and you will receive the truth. Open your heart and open your mind to receive the words that God said that he loved you. You so much that he sent his only son and whoever believes in him will. He didn't say maybe, he didn't say might, he didn't say possibly. He said whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. My friends, open your heart and mind to see the truth. The truth is in Jesus Christ. Amen. And all who believed and all who knew the truth said, Amen. Amen.